Los Angeles. Um, so I do digital publications in my day job. Well, I do, and I also do open source software development as part of that. So we've been working on um, uh, sort of open source framework for digital publications that we're hoping to release. Um, and so I've been interested in this open source world in general and how it, how it plays out in museums. Um, this panel, though, really stemmed from a tweet that happened during uh, MW in the spring in Museums in the Web um, from Dana Allen Greel, who's now at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. She said, who else deserves claps for being generous to the field? Sharing work in progress, lessons learned, guidance through blogs, tweets, conferences, etc." Um, Douglas Higley from MIA uh, piped up and said, hey, check out this list of, of museum open source developers. They should all get a, a clap. They should all get some uh, applause for having contributed to the field. And that was interesting, and, and Dana was interested in that, and I piped up and said, oh, you know what? I'm interested in that too, and maybe I'd, I'd follow up on that and do a little bit more research for MCN 2018. So here we are. Um, so what the, the resource that Douglas pointed to was a list of museums on GitHub that originally started here at this GitHub repo called Muse Tech Central. Um, and it was at that time in, I think, 2013, it first started in 2014. It was 12 museums and a few projects that they had done um, that started a sort of list of, of open source development. That itself had come from an earlier project called Muse Tech Central. Let me see if I can make that a little bit bigger. This is the Wayback Machine, because this is the only version that exists anymore. Um, so this was an MCN um, con uh, sponsored or MCN um, sort of project in which they kind of, there was a, a registry of, of digital projects going on in the museum sector that was being tracked and so that people could come and look at and search. Um, now, of course, you can't search anymore. There's no database in the Wayback Machine, so we only have this first page of results. Um, maybe someday we'll be able to dig in there and, and uncover some of that. Um, so this Muse Tech Central, when this went down, when this database went down, that's when that GitHub repo started as a sort of, let's fill in the gaps a little bit. Um, then, a few years later, um, Aaron Ambros Ambrosani um, from the Norwich Museum, he uh, forked to that repo, which is something you do in GitHub, um, that original Muse Tech one, and he added more museums internationally. Um, and he got the list of museums on GitHub up to about 60 or 70, um, which is pretty great. It sounds like a, so we went from 12 to 60 or 70 in just a couple years, um, and started to look internationally as well. Um, then, after that conversation in April, when we started thinking about about this project and what we're doing now. Um, we went back in again and looked again. Um, and I forked that thing, of course, and I started looking at and made a new thing. And I started looking at, so far I identified 120 museums um, on GitHub at this point. And I think that, and actually, that was as of a couple weeks ago and I found some more and I haven't added them in yet. So we're probably even, even higher than that. And, and we're trying to be, our definition of museum is kind of traditional, but basically I used um, the kind of uh, membership body of MCN is a guideline of what makes a museum a museum. Um, I also, during this process, did focus just on museums and haven't yet, um, but will at some point, I would like to, um, go back and consider vendors and other external developers who are work, doing a lot of work on behalf of museums, because that happens a lot, I think, where museums are reaching out on per, to a vendor specifically and asking them to do development that would be released to open source, um, or developers are just doing it on their own outside of museums, but it's really geared for a museum audience. Um, and so those haven't been included at this point, um, but will. So 120 museums, so 12, 60, 120, pretty good run. Um, but of course, that's just the numbers based on what we found when we happened to look and, and how we were kind of searching through GitHub. So what we did is using those 120 museums, um, this pro what I did for this project is sort of, I went in and um, pulled data from the GitHub API on all those organizations and started trying to visualize, um, do some different visualizations for that and try to understand better what those museums were doing, what kind of repositories they were creating, how they were operating on GitHub. Um, and I am using GitHub. I know there are museums on other, sort, on other um, sort of similar platforms as well, but I think by far GitHub is the dominant platform for um, sort of both posting and sharing and finding open source software. So I stuck to that for now. So looking at that actual GitHub data from GitHub, this bar chart shows the sort of the, um, the joining, museums joining GitHub in their sort of trajectory, like what date they created their organization. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty high peak going, you know, pretty steep curve going up into 2015. Um, but then it started to come down actually since then, um, which might indicate that we kind of have a saturated market. Maybe everyone who's on GitHub, you know, who would think about being on GitHub is now there. I don't know. Um, you also see a dramatic drop in 2018. 
even though it's not the end of the year yet, we could still catch a couple more, but I, I would assume not another 15 or 20 more um, to get us back up to kind of a normal number. So we might really be seeing a decline in terms of joining again. Now, that said, even though there's been a decline in, in, in joining, this is a, a bar chart that shows the repositories created over that same time from those institutions. And that's a much more straightforward up, tra up, upward trajectory. Um, in 2017, we had over 300 repositories have been, been created in 2017 alone. Um, the total number that we're tracking now is are 1,600 repositories created by these about 120 institutions, which is an enor enormous number if you stop and think about it, like more than I've been, I you can't even read that many repositories to know what's in there. Um, again, we see a little bit drop in 2018. Could be a trend, we'll have to see. I think also part of it might be that um, it, if you are a museum, this is something we often do, is we'll start a repositor, a pro, repository excuse me, as um, private and then switch it to public once it's been a little bit fully fleshed out. And so you may see some more things show up. As, and so these are only pri our public repos. Um, so you may see some more show up as time goes on, like that number in 2017 might get, actually get higher over time. So that's where we are. So we're seeing an upward trend of use. Another part of the project that we did that I'm going to talk about a little bit later um, are, is the survey results. So we also did a survey of folks, the stuff trying to get it, information that wasn't available in the GitHub API, um, which is quite a lot, actually. Um, and in that survey, we found everyone that answered, it was a small answering group, so we're going to have to follow up with that. But everyone that answered did say they were either going to continue developing at the same pace they are or at an increasing pace. So no one's expecting to decline their use of um, open source. So 1,600 repositories. And this graph, this is an open website. I didn't mention the, the address is on the bottom. It's at my um, GitHub currently. Um, it's, so it's geelbers.github.io slash mapping dash open dash source. Um, so this website is there. I'm, I'm planning on, on continuing to maintain it as an open source project and hoping to you know, get some folks in there um, adding museums to it, fixing up some of the sort of schlocky code I put in there <laughs> as I was building it. I will admit I'm not a developer first. Uh, but I had fun doing it as a side project. Um, but so this is all online, so I encourage you to kind of go in and check it out and, and, and look around. But this one, if you, in this case, you can actually see, so this is like Cooper Hewitt here. Um, you can hover over and see that it, their kind of contributions um, in repositories year by year. Um, there's also a drop down that you can like look yourself up there too and see the same thing. There's British Museum. Okay, so 1,600 repositories. Sorry, <laughs> I moved too fast for the camera. Um, <laughs> So what's in those 1,600 repositories? So this is a pie chart of the, the languages used. And these are languages that GitHub understands. So there can be things that if the repo is really mixed up or if there's a lot of different stuff going in there, GitHub might not assign a language to it. Um, but this is what we're looking at. So JavaScript is 25% of, of everything that's going on. Um, the next one, and sorry, this thing is not in order over on that side. So you have to just follow the highlights. Um, Python is next. PHP, HTML, and CSS are about the, those, th those five are about the top 60% of repositories. But then there's another 70 different languages being represented otherwise, um, which is pretty interesting. The other thing we can look at are licenses. So by far this big piece of the pie, um, again, what is that, about 33% is on the MIT license. Another 30% or so is an other license, so I mean, it means there's a license file in the repository, but GitHub doesn't understand exactly what kind of license it is, so they can't tell. Um, and then Apache license 2.0 and down on, down on, on it. Uh, owners, again, you can see the, the largest contributors, and I'm gonna skip over this one because it doesn't work very well, sorry. Um, there are a number of contributors that make up a bigger portion of the pie, but you see that um, over time, they actually, um, they'll, they'll have like a couple of years of really heavy involvement. Cooper Hewitt is actually a great example. When they were building up the new, their new museum, were getting ready to reopen, there was a ton of activity, and then it's now sort of tapered off. And that seems to be fairly typical. Well, you'll see some of the people who, who are, some of the um, organizations who are doing the most work at any given moment is really um, limited to a moment. There's some that are more consistent. But. Um, sizes of repositories, again, it varies, but they tend to be very small repositories. Um, this really big piece is just anything under a megabyte. Um, and then types of repositories. So this big thing is original. So these are new, um, new code that someone, or at least as far as GitHub is concerned. Um, the smaller piece of the pie there, which is about maybe 20%, are forks from other, other existing repositories, which means someone made some, some code. If you don't know GitHub, 
I, I, know, I should apologize for the, the um, jargon if I'm throwing that out. Um, I'm happy to answer questions if I'm saying something that doesn't make sense. Um, if, if someone has some code on GitHub, you can go into it as another GitHub user and fork that code, which means you get a copy of it, and then you can do what you want with that code, and GitHub knows that that fork happens and knows where that, knows that path. And so that 20% in these 1,600 are things where a museum went in and forked someone else's code. It's everything, and that could mean that they just liked it and wanted a copy. It could mean they are building off of it. Um, it could mean a number of things. But, and it's usually, in most of these cases, it's stuff outside museums. So these are forks coming from non-museum sources. Um, there are actually only 24 fork, like museum to museum forks that we were able to identify out of all of them, which I'll talk about in a minute too. Um, all right, so that's kind of one way of picturing what's the, what those 1600 are as well. The other thing what we did is create a sort of just a, a, a table of them. So we could see, we could kind of sort and filter by how many like repositories with a lot of stars, with a lot of forks, um, sort of go by the source, like what organization um, used it, the name of the repository as well. Um, the top ones, if I switch to stars here, the top like starred repositories, there's a variety of things, but they tend to, there's a couple patterns. One is museum collection data, gets a lot of stars. Um, it's a, it, which makes sense in a lot of ways because it's a, a star is something that you can just say, oh yeah, that's cool. And you know, it's like in any, in other, any other case, you might not be using that data. It's also, I think, more global. I think more people outside of museums are interested in museum data because they get to build off of it. Um, that would be my guess. So there, there's a bunch of um, data, data, collection data in the top ones there. There's also a number of things that are software that museums have adopted and are maintaining. Um, so it's like a game that, like a, a game that some a museum has taken into their collection essentially, and is using GitHub to maintain. That comes up in a couple different ones in the top. Um, the Cooper Hewitt typeface, which I'm using in this website, also is at the top of the list for stars. Um, so it's a variety of different things. You can also um, so and we can search by you know whether they're Android things or they're iOS things. I think one of the things, one of my sort of um, uh, anecdotal sort of findings about this is that. If we are interested in museums using each other's code and sharing code among museums, which is sort of the starting, starting idea, one of the starting questions of this, of this survey, is this idea of we talk a lot about how open source is great and that we want to be developing open source and that we're, we are happy because you know, other museums can, can build off of this work. But the question is, is that really happening? And I think one thing to, to, to help that happen is being able to identify what museums have done um, and there really isn't any, until, well, until now, there isn't, hasn't been any kind of list um, unless you happen to know the museum or you happen to search on GitHub and find it or happen to have heard about it, NCN, NW, something else. So that idea of just being able to find and identify something from museums um, is something that I think we can work on. Um, one I just wanted to share that I found here that was that we had a conversation yesterday, Colin, about 404 pages. So there's actually a 404 page here from the National Museum. Um, so if you need a 404 page, you can you can fork this one. It's kind of a good one. They've got a, <laughs> so, so right. It's pretty good. Um, so there's some like hidden gems in the in the uh, open source stack there. Um, okay. The last thing that we did with this data before I move on to the survey stuff is we did a, a network visualization, trying to get to what the world looked like. So this is. 100, well, in 105 organizations, because it doesn't include those who are members but didn't have a contributing, didn't contribute a public repository. Um, so these are people who have a, these are organizations that have a, at least one public repository. Um, it's 2,715 2, contributors, which if you think about is a lot more people than there are in museum technology. Um, there are um, 5,000 contributions and, and 24 forks that I mentioned before. So in this diagram, if you can see it, the, um, I can zoom in a little bit. The red dots here are organizations. The um, blue are um, uh, contrib individual contributors. And then the lines, of course, connect them where they, where they are. If you click on them, you can see the list of, of repositories that they've, they've been involved in. And click through to see what those repositories are as well. Um, we try to look for nexuses of connections, essentially. So where are, you'll see in some cases, if I go out a little bit into the peripheries, 
Oh, that's actually, they're connected there. There's, so there's one that, um, there's a one contributor there in the middle. Uh, Tiger Hawk Vox, or Vox, um, <laughs> cool name, um, who has contributed to two different museums. So is in a, in a way, con, you know, connecting those museums, even if those museums might not know. They might just be happen to, happen to be using it as, uh, uh, something that that person has contributed, the same software that that person's been contributed to. Um, there's also some museums that are just floating out there with no public contributors, some that are floating out there not connected. Um, the thing about the connections, though, of course, is if you're a contributor and you, um, you've contributed, made 10 contributions to a code base, um, and that code base is used in four different, four different institutions, you've now made 40 contributions. Mm -hmm. So your work is being multiplied across, across all of that time. So the more that we can use other people's work, the more time we're freeing up because I don't have to have someone else do those 10 contributions all over again because I can take advantage of this other person's. So the sizes of these dots represent also the, the, the number of contributions that people are making and then the connections represent when they're, when they're being reused again and again. Um, is Rob Sanderson here in the room? Oh, yep. So Rob's a good example. Rob, tell me your, um, it's AZ Rob, right? A-Z-A-R-O-T-H. There we go. Oh, so I can search you there. So, so, um, Rob Sanderson is a good example. He's at the Getty, he's sem our semantic architect. Um, but he works on the IIIF spec as well, and a number, number of other things. So there's Rob in the middle, right here. And you can see that he's connected to quite a few different institutions, I think many of which have never paid him. Um, <laughs> right? I mean, maybe they have, I don't know, but under the table, I won't tell. Um, but. His work is, his number of contributions are being multiplied across all those institutions. And one of the things that I'll, I mentioned IIIF, one of the things we see here is that IIIF and its related technologies, which if you don't know, is the International Image Interoperability Framework, <laughs> um, is a new technology, a recent technology that helps, helps museums better store their, their images so that other museums can use it, essentially, or not even museums, but institutions. Um, so that's being um, adopted more and more, and we're seeing that that IIIF and its related technologies are making a lot of connections between these museums. So a lot of these balls of, you kind of see some balls of, um, of contributors there. A lot of those are like, they're all contributors to, say, um, the Mirador re IIIF reader. And so we're seeing that even though Mirador wasn't developed outside of, inside a museum, you can still see that there's some kind of shared use among that thing there in this, in this diet. Um, if you're on GitHub, you can come over to this site. It's not mobile friendly if you haven't figured that out already. Um, but you can search your username and see where you stack up. Um, I myself am only at the Getty, but I looked at this and I, so here I am. Um, and I'm only at, I'm at two Getty institutions, but only because they're the same thing, so it doesn't really matter to me. Uh, but it made me think, oh, I should contribute to someone else so I can get a line connected. <laughs> um, okay, I just have a few more minutes. So. Um, all to say that there's a, there's a lot going on, there's a web of information. I think that um, there are some connections happening, um, but they are, they are not, uh, not so much directly from museum to museum. Um, however, the one thing that we, one of the things that we, other things that we can't track in the um, GitHub API is any other kind of sharing or reuse of code outside of forking, which I think is actually probably a lot. Um, so if you, if I went to GitHub and I found your code, and I thought it was awesome, and I downloaded it directly, and I, I put it into my project, built it into my project, and then I didn't put my project on GitHub. Or if I did put it on GitHub, either way, there's, GitHub has no idea that your piece of code is inside my, my um, project, and I have no way of tracking that. Um, and I think that kind of use actually happens quite a bit. It's something we tried to get, through, get to with our survey we did, so we put out a survey to the community um, far too late, and ill-advised, we should have done it earlier, um, my bad. Um, so we had, but we had 30 respondents and there, was some, there were a few things that I think we can pull away from it, so I wanted to share that as well. Um, and this is these last couple of minutes. So one, what, we asked what the most important factors in evaluating open source code are. So when you're looking at open source code, what things will make you hit the fork button or hit the download button? Um, we, people said, these are the top ones, they said solve a specific problem, Makes sense. Was recently or regularly updated, is well documented, um, and comes from a trusted source. So we have the trusted source thing done in spades, I think. Um, we're probably not so good at regularly and recently updated always. 
Um, and the well documented, there's another, we have another question on that we can talk about. We're, we're pretty, there's, people seem to be pretty good at documentation, but I think it probably varies widely from project to project. The two bottom points here, fits with institutions' needs, maintenance, bandwidth, and tech stack, and is standard based, based and uses up-to-date technology. Those were right in things, but they happened at several different times. I think they're critical and they're good points to bring up. Um, how would you describe the impact to your work of using so open source? Um, I'm gonna read this first quote. Most of the packages I use in most applications are open source. I went to a conference recently that mentioned that 97% of web code is from NPM packages. While, that's, while what's left is the, what the developer writes. That's crazy, <laughs> that is crazy. If that's true, that's crazy. So NPM is an open source repository of, of little bits of code that you can make into bigger bits of code. Um, and it's all free to use, it's all open source. So the fact that if, if it's true that 97% of some part of web code is, is this open source code, um, that's amazing. So um, someone else says, um, it's a great way to experiment without a large budget or enough IT support. Um, open source solutions have broadened my professional capability and angle of view. So I think it's let us do a little bit more than we might otherwise have, have been able to do, which makes sense. How many open source projects have you released in the past 12 months? Um, the red band there, 59% said one to three projects. 27% um, said four to 10 projects. 9% said 10 plus projects, which is amazing, great. So an increasing number, of, a large number of ongoing um, development work. How big is your team? Um, so 50% said two to five, and 32% and, uh, said one. So small, everyone's in fairly small teams. I think that also is probably an indication of you use open source in a lot of ways, like people were saying, it expands your capacity, right? So if you're a small team, you're not gonna rebuild something that you can, you can find something that will make do for you somewhere else. Uh, what are your goals in releasing open source code? So a little word cloud for you, but it came down to collaboration, community, the desire to get it out there, um, to share with others in the field, um, et cetera. I think other, also people question this, and I might, I think it comes in a later slide, but people did question how it was, be, it was were these things being shared the way they kind of wanted it to be. What kind of code do you release? Uh, so mostly 16 uh, people, or 72% said software. Next up was scripts, so smaller little pieces of software. Um, data sets is a big one. Um, and then we also asked about publications or documentation, which I've seen it all, I'm a publishing person, so I'm biased. But I think I do see an increasing use of GitHub for non-code things, so um, like the um, Carnegie Museum's Innovation Studio had a great accessibility um, kind of a website that they put up um, that's on GitHub, and people have used it for content strategy documents and, and that kind of thing. Next. What level of documentation do you provide? So I talked about this a little bit. The README is the one page documentation version. A lot of people use the README, um, which makes sense. It's an easy way of, of talking about your thing. One thing, of course, we didn't go and survey is what level of, of README instruction is it? Is it like a brief paragraph? Is it like, don't ever use this, it's totally crazy, go nuts, or whatever? Is it, or is it like thorough, like step-by-step -step instructions? We don't know. Um, get, people also use GitHub Wiki pages, and some have, have built their full websites around documentation for their, for their code. Um, what kind of code do you release? Oh, that was next, same one I just said, jeez. The documentation, going backwards. Okay, what is the response been to your open source work? So everyone's excited internally. Um, that everyone, people cited as sort of mission driven and matching the mission of, the, of their institutions. Some people said, well, my institution doesn't really know I'm doing it, I'm just doing it, um, which is fine. Um, outside though, I, and I said this before, people aren't always sure how it's being, believed, how it's being um, uh, received externally. This quote gets to that. We always get kudos for releasing our work. Uptake from others isn't always great, partially because, and I paraphrase this, Developers may want to see what we have, that we haven't abandoned it before they adopt it. Um, we may be solving issues in particular ways to us um, that's not use necessarily useful for someone else. Um, and museum developers may not be aware of our work, um, which I talked about before as well. And um, so, and I said this, in the future, do you expect your level of open source to um, go up or stay the same? Everyone agrees, go up, 90% said go up. In the future, do you expect your frequency of releasing open source software to, releasing software to go up again, 77%. So as far as the community is concerned, we're gonna keep doing this. I think the question now for us is, how can we do it in a way that, that, that takes advantage of, of one another's work um, in the best possible way? And I think also start to think about how we can better release code, better document it, better be open source um, maintainers and community members. 
And for this, I wanna give one last shout out to the uh, Mozilla Open Leaders uh, Network. Um, so Mozilla does a lot of work around training people to be open source uh, maintainers and developers and leaders. Um, it's something I've been watching them do and they have like, um, they have maybe two and twice annually, they do a cohort where you can kind of be a Mozilla trained leader and they have a mentorship program where you can join and they, they give you some, some tips and things that I've been wanting to do and hope to do sometime soon. But I think there are some resources out there that we could definitely benefit from. And with that, I will say thank you very much and I'll open for questions. We have like three minutes if anyone has anything they'd like to ask. Yes, sorry. Sir. You said we a lot in, about working on open source. It was like the royal we. <laughs> <laughs> no, so um, Aaron and Rosani from the Nordic Museum was working with, with me a little bit, and also the fact that I was building off of his initial repo and the initial work before, I, I kind of just said that. But largely, I guess it was mostly. Okay. Yes. Did you have a question? I, I kind of. Kind of? Is it more of a comment? <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I'm just wondering. I mean, I, this is great. It's super exciting. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, like you showed that chart in the beginning about that steep decline, and I, we don't know what that is. Is that a huge saturation, whatever? So I'm wondering, do you have thoughts about that? And do you have like a, what are you, how are you going to pursue that, that chart, the implications of that chart? <laughs> yes, that's a good question. Um, yeah, in terms of the steep decline, are you thinking about the people joining or the repositories being created or both? Both. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, in terms of the people joining, it kind of makes sense to me that there's only so many of us that are going to get into it. Yeah, but I mean, the field grows every year. I mean, new people All right, now you're making me feel bad. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you're right. Well, maybe we need to be more active about um, promoting GitHub and training for it. Like, I'm sure, I don't know how many of you in the room, like, like a lot of the jargon, probably went over some heads because I just <laughs> didn't tell you, but we could do some better like professional development around it, certainly about open source development, GitHub usage and that kind of thing, and that might help. So yeah, maybe we should be more active. Maybe I should say that the decline is um, the people who are naturally going to use it or who are more like obviously comfortable, but that we need to take the next step. Um, for me, I, I feel heartened, like I think it's gonna continue. I think we're gonna keep doing it anyway, so we'll see, yeah. Uh I th this is a question, maybe, but uh, in sort of a response, yeah. which is that, like, do you think that what you saw was uh, potentially just a correction after a bit of a bubble? Because I think, as you pointed out, sometimes we are in a rush to release things that can't be really used by anybody else. It's like, hey, it's on GitHub. Uh, so maybe there's just a, mat a maturation happening where it's like, you know, what do you, what do you put out there and when and things like that? Is that do you think yeah. any evidence for that? Or? Yeah, I mean, that makes actually a lot of sense to me, and I think that's something we're talking about at the Getty a lot is that there, you know, we tend to, it's like this excitement of like, let's put it out there, it's open source, like, yay! But now there's this moment, this maturation of like, oh wait, like what does it actually mean to release open source? What should we be doing? How should we be responsible? Yeah, do you have a follow -up? Are funders making this contingent? Like, are they attaching conditions to grants that fund mm -hmm. projects that mm -hmm. the work that gets produced to be released open source? I know that's more a trend in the publishing world, but... Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to, Shell did that, I can, I'm going to ask you, was that on the Knight Foundation, was the open source, was that a requirement, was that you were already doing it open source, so maybe it's... I think both, I'll defer to Shell, as we're more closely with the Knight. Yeah. I'm not positive that it was a requirement, but I think it was certainly a draw. I think he led with that, and yeah. that may have been a factor in Yeah. So just to fill in the gaps there, so um, Shell and Gretchen work on a project at MIA called Art Stories, or Loom, that is an open source art like uh, um, storytelling platform, and uh, they got a, a Knight Foundation to continue work, a Knight Foundation grant to continue work for it. I haven't heard otherwise of, of insisting on open source. I'm sure some people like it. I think there's a, a, a sort of nice thing about it. I have heard there are foundations who are a lot like across the board moving towards insisting on open access research reports. Um, so maybe open source software is then like the next thing. Yeah, yeah, Mark. Uh, I wonder if there's a role for MCN and its leadership in creating a better resource um, to raise awareness for this. I think that, you know, this conference is great and we learn a lot, but mm -hmm. what are we doing as a network to try to um, propagate the sharing of these types of technologies and the information that you provided here? You know, I think it would be really encouraging if the board and the 
looking at the two of you, um, you know, to uh, go this way, Matthew, um, but to, you know, really um, try to help to fuel this and make it more accessible to everyone, because I think that there are a lot of us in this room are doing a lot of great work in this open source and not aware of what each other are doing and how we could potentially help one another to be more successful and instead of focusing on infrastructure could instead be focusing on innovation if we work better together. So I look at you, Matthew, and you, Greg, to try to help um, make this happen. So two, two things. One is I think we can all uh, agree he should blog post this on mcn.eu, yeah. right? Well, that's crazy. Uh, yeah. But also uh, I'll just push that back and say, yeah, we need your help, right? We are we. Yeah. And so you can. Uh, that's a great perspective and we need to as a community sort of figure out how to do that best because what we'll come up with is some cockamamie thing that doesn't serve you so and Kier's going to have, have another idea it looks like. Uh, tomorrow morning Matt oh. and I are hosting a session if you want to get up early 845-925 looking at the uh, upcoming three years of digital strategy at MCN with Colony who I realize is here as well um, uh, oh, yeah. basically putting out mission and values for digital uh, within this organization for you with you with us and hoping to get your input into that and then your input into how better to do less infrastructure and more connections. The, the strength is the connections and we want to amplify them and support those. So hope you yeah, absolutely. want to help craft to be part of it. So tomorrow morning, I'm going to if you want to do some nodding and not here tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but it's karaoke tonight here. You have to speak good words to All right, uh, it's a little after 11. I'm going to let you all go. Thank you so much again. Um, let me know if you have any questions.